Good morning and welcome. Um, before we start, I'd like to introduce myself very briefly. My name is Jan Frank. I'm a professor of food biofunctionality here at Hohenheim at the Institute of Nutritional Sciences. I'm the vice dean of the Faculty of Natural Sciences and the vice director of the Food Security Center. But today I'm actually not here in these positions. I'm here because I'm also the scientific leader together um, with Dr. Samson here. Um, who organized and put together the program for this fifth um, block seminar of the graduate school, Climate Change Effects on Food Security, or as you all know it, CLIFOOD. As you also already noticed, last Tuesday we have the overall theme of this um, block seminar, which is nutrition and food security in the context of climate change. And last Tuesday you already learned uh, topics related to climate change and food and nutrition security. Tomorrow, the block seminar will continue with assessing food and nutrition security. And today, it's all about, it's going to be all about improving food and nutrition security. So we are very thrilled that we have a number of very highly qualified experts who will actually introduce their view and point of views to this subject. And we have Professor Tefera Belachev from Jima University in Ethiopia here. We do have Dr. Friederike berlin Sendai here, who will actually we have a slight change in plan today because um, Dr. Uh, Professor Tefala Belacevia is not here yet. Um, we also have later this um, afternoon Professor Michael Gravinke from the University of Gießen, uh, Professor Ismail Chakmak from Sabanchi University in Istanbul here, and we have Dr. Wolfgang Stütz from this university, is actually one of my staff members, a postdoc in my group. And I wish you all a very interesting day here with, I hope, a lot of new things to learn and a lot of new topics to address. And before we go into the next steps here, I would like to hand over to Dr. Tesfaye Abebe, who is also uh, the scientific leader of Clive Food at Havasa University. Of course, you probably all know him very much already. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Frank. Uh, Frank, Assistant Director for Food Security Center, and Professor Bogele, Dean, College of Agriculture, respected resource persons, uh, supervisors, scholars, and uh, live food team members. Very happy to welcome you to the University of Hohenheim to attend live food blog seminar five which is organized under the theme Nutrition and Food Security in the Context of Climate Change. Uh, actually, food security has been a major challenge to major developing countries like Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, for instance, we have food insecurity has been a problem for, for decades. At present, there are 10 million people, especially living in degraded highlands and marginal lowland areas that are affected with food security problems. And this climate change is really aggravating the problem. There have been slight improvements in, cultural, in improving agricultural productivity over the last decades, but this couldn't really Hope with the population growth. Population is growing faster than grows in cultural production. So we have to come up with new approaches, with new strategies to cope with the I do hope that Clive Food will contribute to that. Uh, it deals with climate change as well as security issues, and uh, it brings dis different disciplines to tackle the intricate problems of farmers, lots of climate problems. One good thing that we learned over Clifford is that uh, we are learning a lot from other disciplines outside our, our, our specializations. We appreciate other disciplines. And we always think how to link our discipline with others. 
and add value and also contribute to mitigation of the problems. We do try to uh, deal how farmers can better manage climatic shocks and risks and secure livelihoods. So this is really a very good uh, project that could bring us together, that helped us in thinking toward the systems approach and also think, think, trying to see things in holistically and broaden our, our outlook. And uh, one of these components is the nutrition and food security seminar that we are going to attend. We have been actually, well, it has started already on Tuesday, and we have also been attending the food, hang, uh, the, the, the hidden hunger, hidden hunger congress, which is also quite related to the theme. And uh, we have grasped a lot of things. Also, we are from different backgrounds. We are now trying to learn about nutrition and related issues. And we are going to learn more from the presentations of our distinguished resource persons. And uh, we'll have fruitful days, I think. Uh, and by this juncture, I would like to sincerely thank the organizers, uh, Professor Frank, uh, Dr. Samson, and also the Clive Food team members, coordinators, and also all, all of you. And uh, I wish you a fruitful and enjoyable two days seminar. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now very happy to hand over the microphone to Professor Ralf Vögele, who's the Dean of the Faculty of Nat uh, Agricultural <laughs> Sciences. <laughs> we get you on board. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Frank. So I, I've, I've been called the uh, Dean of the Faculty of Natural Sciences a number of times before. I, I am a biologist by training, so it's not absolutely unrational, but I'm still the Dean of the Faculty of Agricultural Sciences. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to Hohenheim once again. It's a great pleasure and honor to welcome you to the fifth block seminar of the German-Ethiopian Sustainable Development Goals Graduate School. I continue with SDG, uh, Climate Change Effects on Food Security, Clay Food. A special welcome goes to Dr. Tesfaye Abebe, the scientific leader of Clay Food at Havasa, Professor Jan Frank, Vice Dean and Vice Director of the Food Security Center, scientific leader of the Clive Food, and also the major organizer of this fifth block seminar. I would also like to welcome Dr. Samson Gepremedin, Professor Tefera Belachev. I don't think he's here yet. He's coming. Dr. Ismail Chakmak from Sabanchi University in Istanbul. Uh, Professor Krawinkel. I haven't seen him either, <laughs> but I'm sure they will show up. Uh, Dr. Frederike Belin Sessai, was that pronounced correct? And of course, Dr. Wolfgang Stütz from the University of Hohenheim. Ladies and gentlemen, food security is a global problem, although many people in the so called developed world may not have realized the magnitude of this problem yet. Almost everyone in the developed world has easy access to high quality food in sufficient amount, and only hidden hunger may be considered a problem in these parts of the world. And you had a chance uh, to attend this year's conference on hidden hunger uh, as part of this block seminar with a focus on nutrition and food security in the context of climate change. Providing food security for everyone on a global scale will be the ultimate challenge for the decades that lie ahead of us, especially considering the ever-growing world population and a steady decrease in arable land. We can all do without a car. We can all do without a smartphone, although it might be difficult. But we cannot do without food. Food security is also a multifaceted topic. A sustainable increase of agricultural production may be the most important issue, but certainly not the only aspect of food security. Increasing the availability of food and food products, reducing poverty, 
which is a prerequisite for improved access to food, and ensuring the stability of food systems are also very important factors. Food security is highly sensitive to climatic changes. Food production, access to markets, as well as income from agricultural activities are inseparably connected with climate-related events. Ethiopia, as Dr. Tesfaye Abebe already pointed out, is facing one of the most severe droughts in half a century, almost all my lifetime. As agriculture is the backbone of the Ethiopian economy, extreme weather events like this can plunge the entire economy into crisis. As a result of the worst drought in decades, it is estimated that more than 10 million people are at risk of starvation. In 2016, the Ethiopian government has therefore committed itself to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. The DAD program, Bilateral Sustainable Development Goals Graduate Schools, funded by the Federal Ministry of, for Economic Cooperation and Development, is designed to help achieve the new sustainable development goals which are related to the core areas ending hunger and poverty and ensure human dignity, equality and health, and environmental protection by funding bilateral higher education institution partnerships in establishing sustainable development goals, graduate schools in developing countries. The German-Ethiopian Sustainable Development Goals Graduate School Climate Change Effects on Food Security between the University of Hohenheim and its Food Security Center with Hawassa University in Ethiopia is based on a long-standing and trustful collaboration between the two universities and has been established as part of this program in 2016. I actually vividly remember the kickoff meeting held in the balcony hall close to two years ago on March the 8th, in 2017. The main objectives of this program is the education of African students at the doctorate level in the field of climate change, agriculture, and food security to address the threats of climate change to food security in the Eastern African region. The SDG, CLIFOOD, between the University of Hohenheim and Havasa, has two focuses on two major aspects, teaching and research and capacity building. Now, in the framework of this program, there were six major outputs considered, and I think we almost completed or are close to completion of all six major outputs that we envisioned. We selected the scholars. They have held a number of block seminars already. All of them attended the first block seminar on the introduction to state of the art in research on climate change and food security with respect to the SDGs and food and feed crops held in 2017 at Havasa, climate modeling at the University of Hohenheim, and sustainable intensification of African livestock systems in a changing world, again at Havasa University in 2018. With just two days to go, you've almost completed the fifth block seminar on nutrition and food security in the context of climate change. I hope you had a successful start to the block seminar Enjoyed the participation in the Hidden Hunger Conference as well as the field trip yesterday. For today and tomorrow, I wish you all interesting lectures and presentations and stimulating discussions on the different topics presented by the scholars. I wish you all a very pleasant remaining time in Hohenheim. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now I actually have a question. <laughs> do we go along as in the program because you arrived? Or do we start with Friedrich? OK. Then <laughs> I would like to um, welcome Dr. Friederike Berlin Cesai, who will actually be talking about the role of gender in food and nutrition security. Sorry? Yes, we changed. We keep the change, yeah, yeah, we keep the change. That's what we, <laughs> thank you. So, Friederike. Thank you.
uh, I invite you to think with me out of the box. Uh, you see the topic here, nutrition and food security in the context of climate change. I would like to discuss it in the context of gender change. Um, or how is gender, to re uh, gender related to this topic? A few remarks. I looked during the, during the introductions to those pictures. You see a proud woman doing all the job. You see here a woman doing all the job. Um, I don't know whether this is a woman or a man on the other picture. You, uh, from the back, you hardly see this. But then I look around in this, in this room. Whom do I see? Majority men. Ah, what's wrong? Something is wrong somewhere, I guess. And then I look again here. Where is your SDG on gender equality? It's missing. So this is that just the introduction remark. Now you can open my presentation. Whilst I do say something about my, my own um, career, etc. So my name is Friederike Berlin Cessé. Cessé is a Sierra Leonean name. That means I'll take you partly to Sierra Leone. I'm here at the University of uh, Hohenheim at the Food Security Center, the coordinator for another university collaboration that is with the Jala University in Sierra Leone. And um, some of the topics I will show you here I'm pretty sure we can relate them to Ethiopia as well, yeah? And uh, if there are issues that I'm discussing with you where you say, oh, no, Ethiopia is completely different, that's fine, yeah? Be very frank, be very open, and say, well, no, 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 no. It's not true what you're saying. Oh, that's the pointer. So I have studied human nutrition at the University of Gießen, and I've been working there as a research assistant for a long time now. I'm a freelance consultant. That means I do teach at various universities, um, but then I do as well consultancy. So I have a very mixed, uh, mixed, uh, yeah, portfolio that I'm covering. Now, what I I, I told this uh, the topic gender in Sierra Leone, and it's your task to to go back to your own country and see whether that is similar or different, right? And I called it as well from gender sensitive to gender transformative approaches in food and nutrition security, okay? So um, what I always say is in Sierra Leone, people say, well, you know, the malnutrition situation is still very bad. We had the civil war, um, we had Ebola, and this is why we are not improving. Now I'll show you here pictures. Um, do I, oops, sorry. No? Ooh. You can see it here from 2013. They are fluctuating always around, around the same margin. There's no improvement. Oh, it's in the middle. Oh, yeah. It's, all, it's always around this 40%. No matter whether there was civil war, like in this area, you even see in this area of civil war, the stunting rates were not really worse. You, get, you cannot say this. So to hide behind things like civil war is maybe not what we can do. Yeah. Um, so the big puzzle here is, why is there no real progress in, in combating stunting, a sign of chronic malnutrition in Sierra Leone? And I know, those rates are similarly high. Now they're around 30%, I guess, in Ethiopia. Yeah, I'll, I'll have some data for you later. Um, how much can stagnation be related to rebel war or Ebola? I think I've told you that there is no real relation here. Um, has there been any change in food intake in the population? I came to Sierra Leone the first time in 1984, and what I saw there is exactly what I see now, except that maybe for the urban population, something has changed. But the rural population is still based on a lot of rice, a little bit of uh, sauce on top, hardly any fruits, hardly any vegetables, and a gender-sharp uh, deviation in what people can eat, especially between men and women, okay? Um, are there any food taboos and food habits yeah, in, this, in this country that are responsible for this stagnation? And I think, yeah, that is true. And the last one, what else could be responsible for the stagnation? 
And I said stagnation of stunting rates, high morbidity and mortality rates are partly due to persisting gender inequalities. And I'm trying to show you now why I feel this is the case. And I, I'm, I personally am convinced, unless we are really trying to improve on this, we will not make any progress. Okay? So there are observations. I was working in the 80s in a Bopujan project. And the Bopujan project in Sierra Leone had a women's component. They were really trying. I mean, for a long time, people said, well, we have to concentrate on women now. They didn't talk gender. We have to concentrate on women. We have to show them how they can generate income, right? But then I looked during the same time in my own PhD research in income. And even though you had the women with a lot of groundnut and vegetable production, when it came to income, we had one male enumerator always doing the interview with men, and we had one female doing it with women. The bulk of the income from, from vegetables and from groundnut appeared on the men's questionnaire. So women, again, did all the job, but men had the income. And women were just the ones going with the small bits to the market, you know, this little, little income. And usually they take this income straight away to exchange it for anything they need for cooking. Then um, women were always doing the whole job of cracking and cleaning and sorting coffee beans. But the income appeared only on the men's questionnaire. And the, the men will say, well, we have this amount of money that we'll give to the wife to cook a proper meal. And this money is very often just too little. And women have to go out and, and, and try to see what else they can do. And we are coming back to this topic why this is so important to, um, to, to realize. So income disparity and control over resources is still a huge problem in Sierra Leone. Maybe in Ethiopia? Aha, uh -huh. OK. So that is already similar, right? There are more observations, right? Broken down water wells. We have done a lot of water wells in, in villages. As soon as they are broken down, they remain broken down. Because it's women who have to go down to the riverside to catch the water. My hypothesis is, if it is men's responsibility to fetch water, this water well is being repaired in no time because they have the control over resources. Next one. Cooking takes place on three stones. And again, if it would be men's responsibility, we would see perhaps a better technology and maybe a stove. My Jala lecturers told me yeah, from the Jala University, well, if there is a stove, we can do it. I said, ah, and on the three stones, you cannot do it? <laughs> on top of this, male students at Jala University, they know how to cook. As soon as they are married, they forget about everything. They cannot do it. Women have to do it. It's the same in your country? Ah, OK, you see the similarity? <laughs> so collecting firewood is, again, women's responsibility, right? Um, there are more observations. Oh, that, that, that's again. So now I come to a, um, an example from the Somali refugees, which I met in Doloado camp in the, south, in the south of Ethiopia. So I discussed with those refugees uh, that this responsibilities, and I said, no, 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 you are not right. If we have a donkey cart, we men can go and get the firewood. If we don't, women do it. I said, are women your donkeys? <laughs> what kind of perception is this, right? And um, then we have to talk about, of course, gender and climate change. All the above issues that I've shown you they have a very direct impact on women's workload because men are not doing it. That means if there's a drought, they have to go even a longer distance to get water or a longer distance to get their firewood. Life becomes more and more difficult for women. Yeah? So this is, this is how I'm trying to bridge now your topic with the climate change. And you know why our agenda debate is for various reasons so important. So there are more observations over time. The distribution of food within the family, food taboos, usually exist for pregnant women and small children. For men, you have some kind of foods, but they only make them sexually strong. That's the attachment. But there's nothing else but women and small children who very, really need very high quality food. 
they face all those taboos. Then food preferences are always given to men. I mean, first of all, I have to state, yes, men have usually a, a higher demand in terms of calories, but not in terms of, of, of food quality, yeah? Um, and not, not uh, in terms of food quantity, sometimes pregnant women, as you know, they, at the end of, of their pregnancy, of course, they have a higher demand. Especially meat is predominantly given to men. Is that in Ethiopia the same? The biggest portion? Or oh, men say no, women say yes, that's very interesting. <laughs> uh -huh. Now I'll show you some data again from my, from my Dolo Ado experience uh, in, in uh, Ethiopia. I looked into the Dolo Ado camps where you have the Somali refugees and the Somali refugee kids, they came with a, with a stunting rate of only 17%. Why? It's relatively low, because the Somalis, they live with their animals. There is much more high quality animal protein in their diet. So they, that's, that's the thing. Their stunting rate was quite low. Now they came into the camps, and with time living on plant-based diets, you see how these stunting rates increased. Because the refugees even said, you know, the kind of diet we are getting here is not we are, what we are used to, living on sorghum and really plant-based things. We, have, we don't have milk. And you really see the impact on the stunting rates with time. Yeah? Whilst these are the, the rates for Ethiopia from the DHS, 44% in 2011 and 38% in 2016. So it's almost similar to what we saw in, in Sierra Leone as well, right? So high quality protein in the diet of small children is so important. Yet, if we do nutrition education, we give this nutrition education only to women. Yeah? Very, very seldom and rarely you see that you really find that they are inviting men to give them some nutrition education. And I can assure you, I've met a lot of men, they said, Friederike, I didn't know. That's not a big deal. Of course, I can give some of, of the, the meat or the, the, the milk or these high animal products to my child if I know this impact on brain development, on stunting, etc. Yeah. So we are even gender based or gender biased uh, in, our, in our development approach, yeah? neglecting men in this. OK, so I have, oops, I have this. We can go on. So there are. Um, gender uh, in Sierra Leone and changes over time. First of all, we have to look into education, which is a real big issue in, in uh, Sierra Leone. And there is a huge, huge gender gap. If you just only look at no education and you, and you, you look into the group, this is for women, 80% between uh, of the women, 45 to 49, 80% had no education. If you look into men, it's 61%. That's equally not good. So we have to improve on both sides, but there is, a, there is a difference. And you could go through all the statistics here, and you can go into the DHS report of, uh, for Ethiopia, and you'll find the same data, and you'll see how the gender disparity is uh, for Ethiopia. Now, uh, the IFRI in 2000, had, they had published a study on the estimated contribution of major determinants in the reduction of child malnutrition. These are data between 70 and 95. And they estimated that women's status in the society and women's education together contribute to more than 50%. And yet, there is so little education for women. I have even talked to Jala lecturers, senior lecturers, and they said, you know, I have three girls. Maybe, yes, secondary school is nice, but I'm not going to send them to university because then they are not finding a husband. I said, oh. Very interesting, high level people discussing it this way because they still see the role of women to be back in the house and you know, do, do all the household chores. Now, IFRI has done the same thing again and you see here now, now data from 2013. It is now their estimate, they, they see that there is almost a one third, one third when it comes to food, women's education and status and water and sanitation. So I've done this, they, they, they did this again, and especially this party of water and sanitation is very important. And again, with climate change and maybe more droughts, this is a part that is very difficult to deal with. 
Okay, so educated women have healthier children. You have the statistics all over the place, which shows you if there's no education, there's a very high under five mortality rate in Africa. If there is four to six years, it go, it's going down and a plus seven years plus. I mean, it's still 100, but at least it's, it's half of what it is if, if women have no education. And you can see this is, again, educating women as compared to females per 100 males. As soon as you come closer to gender equality as well in education, you see reduced mortality rates. So that is very clear, and it's a, it's a very broad picture. Now, differences exist in many parts. We, we said it, reduction in child mortality. We, this has an impact as well on family planning. We have, especially in countries, if, if I look into Niger, this is, this is not leaving my mind. Niger has a lot of problems, especially due to climate change with droughts and all the rest of it. They have malnutrition rates, acute malnutrition rate that's out of the box. This is amazing. Yeah, and then they start bringing up a program for women and children and they give them extra food to avoid this. And you know what is the ultimate result? They have even more children. Because due to the food aid that they're getting for pregnant and lactating women they, and, and for small children up to two years, they see this as an income source. And the result is that you have more and more malnourished children in the nutrition rehabilitation centers. And they are really in a very bad state. So food aid is not the answer. In fact, it could be detrimental. So then there's another topic, which is to me extraordinary bad, gender-based violence. Um, it's entrenched in many societies. I don't know whether there's a lot of gender-based violence in Ethiopia. Hmm? There is, of course there is. There's a lot of sexual violence, especially in conflict, all over the world. Whenever there is conflict, women are being raped all over the place, all over. 80% of the perpetrators of violence are men. There is, of course, another violence. And there is as well violence that parents already start to their small children. These children behave because they are very afraid because they have learned from day one, if I don't behave, boof, that's the result. Yes, you feel maybe they are behaving better, but it's, it's there where the, the violence and the violent behavior starts. So the reasons for battering are sometimes very trivial. And now we are coming to it. Wife not cooking meal for husband or not cooking the right meal or not the quality meal the, the husband expects. Infidelity. Men can always go out and, and find girlfriends and have, have sex with other, uh, with other women around, and nobody, women have no say, at least in Sierra Leone. As soon as it's the other way around, there's gender-based violence. There's denial of sex or revenge. Now we go back to our DHS report. Now this is attitudes towards wife beating, and this is women's perception. And this is, she burns the food, she argues with him, goes out with her, out telling him, neglects children, and you refuses to have sexual intercourse with him. And here you have the percentage who agree with at least one of the specified reasons here. And now look at this. 60% on average of all women feel the man has the right to beat them up for these trivial reasons. So we have to work on women's minds they don't have the right to do this. Now we look, the same statistics is there for the attitude, uh, what, what men feel. Men, yeah, there's, a, there's 30%, half of them, yeah, half of that percentage, but still 30% say they have the right to do this. No, they don't. They don't have the right to do this. Now we are coming back to the nutrition education and all what we are telling women. We tell them in nutrition education, you have to do this and this and that, and then take meat from your husband and give more to your child, and maybe you're pregnant for yourself. In fear of gender-based violence, she's not going to do it. She will turn around and say, but you don't know my reality. And she's not going to change. Hmm? Okay. There are movements here. This is one of the, the, the village heads in one village. Men defend equality. Use your might to protect women, not to harm them. Men for gender equality and maternal health. There are a lot of projects going on now. But I think it's a long way that we still need to go. We are going back to gender, marriage, and sexuality. 
In most African cultures, it's the men who, who when, when they marry, they have to pay dowry. In Ethiopia as well? Yep. So women are considered to be an asset because they have been bought somehow. Yeah. So they can, can be divorced in, in uh, Sierra Leone if they don't become pregnant women. Then the man said, well, you can, can't really deliver a child, so I'm, I just go in search of another one, not asking whether maybe the fault is at the men's side. It's possible sometimes as well. Um, women face sexual harassment, harmful cu cultural, uh, cultural practices, stigma, and discrimination all over the place. The present government in Sierra Leone, I know Ethiopia has a wonderful government now, the present government in Sierra Leone is really trying to change the scene. Hands of our girls, a lot of, a lot of things, they will put you into prison as soon as there's rape or any, any sexual harassment, they will really try to go against it. They put up special, special uh, units where women can go and report because for a long time women wouldn't report to the police because all the policemen are men. So there's nothing they can do, right? Um, culturally, it's acceptable for a man to marry more than one wife, have mistresses, have children outside the marriage, yet the woman has no say. And because she's not educated, she has not her own income, she'll not go out of that marriage because what is she going to do? Yeah? People said, ah, you know, you have this high divorce rates in Europe because of this. I said, yeah, because women sometimes say enough is enough. And because they are educated, they have their own income, they can live peacefully without facing all this harassment. And I think this is what we have to, have to learn. Now, another big problem in Sierra Leone, these are teenage pregnancies. We have 13% uh, um, of all the girls are already married at the age of 15, and at the age of 19, already 39% of all girls in Sierra Leone are married. And teenage, teen, uh, up to 19, you are a teenager, um, so this is a real problem. Now, UNICEF have, has put up a campaign here. How do you see this poster? Teenage pregnancy, not me, not now. Think, dream, and choose. Any comments from your side to this poster? To me, this is striking. Why? I don't like it. Why? There was somebody trying. Yep. Yep. Sexual uh, uh, pregnancy always needs two. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it's not their choice, especially if there's rape. We are now having a private project uh, since a couple of years, and we are now on our third school that we are constructing. It was a village coming close, uh, coming to approach us, and I said, you know, we cannot send our girls again to secondary school because they have to go this way 10 kilometers to the secondary school in McKinney. So they have to take either motor taxis, yeah? And then rape on that way happens so often. So we keep our girls at home because we don't, that, that's not the choice of girls. So we are right now um, constructing a junior secondary school for that village together with the Catholic Church. They provide the teachers to make sure these girls can go to school again without of, yeah, fearing sexual harassment. But we cannot only address this to girls, that's completely wrong. We have to look at those, at the, at the group that is really responsible for it. One village, they were really great. They said, okay, if that happens, both boy, maybe if, if it's if it's a school boy and, and a girl, they will sit at home up to the time that the child is born and then they can go both back to school. Usually the girl drops out of school, yeah? So far so good. But then the teachers were the ones. So can you ask a teacher to sit at home <laughs> well, up to that time? So th the problem is really um, uh, enormous and we have to really work on this. So, how can nutrition in Sierra Leone improve if women are afraid to change food preparation in favor of their children due to gender-based violence? Women have no control over their resources. Women girls are denied higher education and have no control over their sexuality and are overburdened with domestic work without any time-saving technology. 
how can this really improve? And to me, this is really the reason, the main reason why we still see this stunting rates high up there and there is no improvement. So I coming, I'm coming back to this hypothesis. We need to have gender equality in place, otherwise even 30 years down the line, we'll still see high values of stunting in Sierra Leone. So whenever there is a bad story, there's always hope. Um, there is a West African uh, NGO called SEND, and they are talking about the gender transformative approaches. And what they did is they said, we have to sensitize and mobilize husbands to live equitably with their wives and to ensure that their boys and girls will be given the same opportunities. That's very important. And they call this the gender model family approach. So I'm going to, uh, trying to introduce you to this kind of approach and uh, the first results that they can show as well in, in Sierra Leone. So what they do is they start first of all with the community sensitization, uh, wherein they try to explain what is, what is on their mind about this gender model family. And they ask people to be, or families to be volunteers. So nobody is forcing you into this approach but they are looking out for volunteers in those communities. And I assure you, they have them. Then those families, they get their first training, their second training, there's a monitoring to it, there are monthly meetings and experience sharing across the villages, et cetera, with all these gender model families. And you can see already what uh, in the pictures and images I put onto these slides, uh, the changes that you can see, yeah? that all of a sudden fathers can as well take care of children. Remember, gender-based violence, the woman is not taking good care of the child, as if the man can't, they, they can't do it. Of course they can do it. So expect, uh, expectations from being a gender mon uh, model family is, it fosters unity and harmony in the family and in the community is joining the path to development and starting a modern life. So they have attached the, the modern style to this gender model family to make it attractive. And people want to be modern. Yeah, they don't, every, every person want, doesn't want to be old fashioned. Yeah, you want to be modern. Uh, being better parents and training children together and engaging in business opportunities which they both, in which they both trust each other. That's the other thing. If you talk to women, they sometimes say, I don't know what my, my husband has in terms of income. Yeah? Or, or the wife tries to hide the kind little income she is getting somewhere that the husband doesn't know because if he knows, she has to bring that, that income over to him. Right? So there is no trust in the family. There's mistrust over the place and then, of course, violence all over the place. Being happy together and enjoy better relationships. So the perceptions of being a role model is you must wash yourself because the community is watching you now. So they are very much aware. These gender model families, they are very much aware of this. Um, they feel they are special and very unique because they are doing something different now. Okay? And then they said they are an example, doing something good, doing the right thing. And they said they are the light of the community and need to keep shining. They have to really show to the community that this can work. And they are the agents of change within the community. And the good thing is that there are more and more families coming, wanting to, to become gender model families in the societies and the communities where they have started the approach. So a midterm review of this project for, showed the following results. 98% of all husbands assist in food preparation and if it's fetching water, um, firewood, or sometimes cooking, they can do it, yeah? Because then, if you can see here in the picture, it frees space for the woman to do exclusive breastfeeding. We cannot teach women do exclusive breastfeeding if she has all the other household cores and there is no kind of assistance to her. She's, she's not able. And we know how important exclusive breastfeeding is. Then 81% uh, report about joint decision making in the home. This is very good. This is a very high percentage. 48% said they will give the better part of the meal to wives or children. Well, 48%, that's already quite, quite an improvement. Of course, we want to see 
yeah, a better percentage here, but I find for midterm review that this is a very good achievement already. 33% will even feed the children. I mean, they can do it, not breastfeeding, of course, but as soon as there's pub and, oops, pub and all the rest of it, of course, um, they can do it and they can help. And 27% of their husbands will do household calls whilst the wife is breastfeeding. So I think maybe this is a very good approach. This is right now uh, accompanied from KIT, the Netherlands, with more research to the gender model family approach. But the first results, they are really very, very promising. And there were more qualitative findings from the focus group discussions. There were economic effects when husband and wife are managing household, saving money and avoiding wastage. Because now there's transparency of, of what is there and they can decide in common what they can spend on different things in the household. They said it has a social effect, less domestic disputes, mutual respect and more peace in the house. Then they said there is a human capacity effect. Girls have more time and energy to study because even if we engage the children to help in the household, it's most of the times the girls that we are engaging. So they don't, don't find real time to study and do something for their own uh, human capacity development. And then there's the recognition in the community and the benefit of the gender model family and the lifestyle. It's really recognized in those communities where SEND has uh, brought in that kind of approach. And like I already said, there's this promising spillover effect that other families feel, okay, let's try this. It could work, right? And the, 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 the most important point is, if we talk about gender disparities, we, we very often talk about power. Yeah, it's a power gap. Who has more power? If it is 70% and 30%, I know men are very, very, very much afraid uh, yeah, to be overpowered or that they have to give in so that we have a 50-50% power. It's not about who has more power over the other, but to challenge all the kind of force we have into the right direction, into development. It's not this kind of, of game, but getting, oops, getting this force to really achieve something for the family and for the whole household. So the application, you can do this in any kind of community mobilization program, uh, at the center, and that is definitely the center of the approach. It can be, be used in a variety of projects as an attachment, but it can be a project in itself, right? And um, in the experience in Sierra Leone is using it in a combination with nutrition education. And then nutrition education goes as well to men. It's gender. It's not, not that, that, uh, that we only teach uh, pregnant and lactating women and, and with their small children and the 1,000 days initiative. No, men need to understand. And I assure you, all the men I've talked to, once they said, well, uh, we didn't know. Of course, we will do this. Yeah, And very often, this is what I've seen as well, men are more progressive in their thinking. You've seen this in the gender-based violence uh, perceptions. But we have asked already um, men as well, uh, do you think your wife should take part in community meetings? Do, can she voice out what she feels yeah, is right? And more men are saying that she should do it, and women are saying, oh, it's not our role. So we have to work on perceptions on both sides. Yeah, so that, that is really the, the combination where you can see it in Sierra Leone and it's working, working quite well and people are really reporting about more harmony, more unity in the family, which I feel is, is a really nice achievement. So the next steps is um, we need, of course, gender sensitivity to understand what is wrong. Yeah, but that is not enough. Um, if, we, if we remain with this step of being gender sensitive, we need a consequent inclusion of men in all forms of nutrition education programs. And that has been neglected for a very long time. Then we need gender transformative measures targeting especially youth. And this is for me a very important topic. In development, we have always children up to five years. Maybe preschool children in school feeding program and then there is a gap for the youth. And then we, uh, 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 we are going back when a woman is pregnant. Then we support pregnancy. But I think we have to intervene more with youth 
And then we can include topics like, for example, nutrition, health, gender-based violence issues, and family planning. A small girl or a young woman who is married, I always say she's already in the trap. She's already in the trap, in, in this gender inequality trap. HIV prevention, depending on the country, is of course a very important topic there as well, and you can, you can really um, find many, many more. And uh, this is now open for you to see whether this is something that uh, is relevant for Ethiopia and relevant to the topic even of climate change, and maybe relevant for your Clifood or Clifood, how do you say Clifood project? Um, to include as well in the sustainable development goals, the gender equality, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think so there are questions. I hope so. Um, Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Um, the first question is about this model, this uh, gender model family. Um, well, when NGO has started, um, and what will happen if the life of that NGO ends? What about the sustainability? That's the problem that we have in developing nations, you know? Something is started. And then when the life of that project ends, then everything stops there. So, you know, the start is very nice, it looks good, it's interesting, but what about if that project doesn't exist anymore? That's one. The other issue, <coughs> when, it comes to, when it comes to Ethiopian situation, you know, in Ethiopia we have different types of traditions. Um, some of the traditions are led to nations, nationalities, and so on. So, um, in some uh, situation, uh, we can perhaps observe there might be some uh, gender inequality, uh, but in most of the you know the country, as far as I know, um, when the man is outside, he's working. The wife could be at home; she would be cooking and so on. So you know there is, by default, there is an equality. There is a normal, you know, so a complementary, so to say, a complementary. So. Um, that is um, very difficult, you know, to say um, there is always gender inequality. Of course there is, but it all depends upon where we are. And the other issue, uh, when you say in Europe, um, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, the woman is educated. If, it is, if she doesn't want, she can divorce. And I don't think that's the proper way. I'm sorry, you know, uh, because uh, you know, marriage is it is uh, it is a kind of life where both must live, uh, you know, together. Despite the fact, you know, there might be some differences. Um, so sometimes um, education by itself should not be a disastrous. If a family is abandoned, then you can imagine what will happen to the children if, because of the divorce. So what's really going on in Europe is not really. Uh, so, and it's also not good to talk about on one side. What about the men? The men role must be also uh, recognized, you know, as well. So that's a kind of comment. Thank you. Yeah. If I may just answer to it. Of course, the sustainability thing, we have seen this in many projects that we're not really um, touching on, 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 on gender relations, etc. I totally agree. You have a project, and I, I, I really start wondering. I mean, we have done wash education, all the kind of thing from the 80s. And as soon as the project goes, everything collapses again. Yeah. Um, so we have to find other approaches. Um, and... I feel that some of the projects collapse because uh, uh, the whole wash area, like water, sanitation, hygiene, is a women's responsibility. Nutrition, education, cooking is a women's responsibility. And uh, I th this is my hypothesis. So we cannot say whether, whether this is sustainable after all. But I want to believe if a, if a family has seen the advantage of having more harmony in the family, Will they go back only because the project is going? And then they will always change and say, well, the project is gone, and now I'm the boss again, and we, we stop all of this? I don't know. I believe they are human beings like we are, 
And I hope that this can continue, but of course, I cannot tell you for now anything about the sustainability uh, in, uh, effect. This is why Kit from, the, from Holland is now trying to accompany this approach and Welthungerhilfe will work with it. Now the other one is about tradition. Yes, there is tradition, and I, I know this is highly, highly recognized everywhere, but tradition can as well impede development because we, we cannot always say this has been always like this. In our society, men go out and work and women stay at home. That is our role division. That's a sharp difference. It's maybe very different in an urban setting as, to, as compared to a rural setting. But I believe if both of them can go out and earn income and they share in the household course, they'll be better off. So we have to think twice whether we can always hide ourselves behind this is our tradition. I'll give you one example uh, about tradition and this is what I, what I experienced with my own mother. When I was brought up, bottle feeding was the order of the day. Breastfeeding was out because Nestle has really shown that bottle feeding is, is what we should go for. So when I had my three children and I was exclusively breastfeeding them and my first son, he was always very lazy. After two hours, he would stop. Uh, no, every two hours I had to breastfeed him and I could breastfeed not even five minutes. He was sleeping again. <laughs> I could not do anything. My mother said, he's not getting enough. You have to give them a bottle, etc." So I had this kind of, of debate with her. And uh, of course, I know there's a lot of respect for the elderly generation and you don't want to hurt her. I, I had one discussion, I said, ah, oh, then I have done everything wrong. I said, no, mother, you have done what was the order of the day there, but now we know different things. And from that point on, I avoided that kind of discussion because I didn't want to hurt her. At the same time, um, I felt we should really do things different and not because she is telling me as and grandmothers in, in Sierra Leone and in Ethiopia, I guess as well, have a very high value in what they have to say. The same is for, for um, uh, female mutilation. The elderly generation will always say, the genital mutilation, yeah? The elderly generation will always say, well, but this is our tradition. But if we know how harmful this is and that it's not in any religious book, etc., then we have to find a way to, to forget sometimes about some of the traditions. Yeah, for the sake of the health of, of for example, women in this case. Yeah. So we cannot always hide behind tradition. That was your, your second point. And the third point is about divorce. Sure, it is not good. But then we have to look into the reasons why there is divorce. And um, my husband is from Sierra Leone, and I believe we are a gender model family because we are really sharing in, in household course. We have one account, two cards to it, whatever we earn is on that account, whatever we take. And it's not like you have paid this for the children, I have paid that for the children, or you know, this, this kind of uh, funny debate. Um, and yeah, he's from Sierra Leone and he is, he is perfect. He's, there, there is no doubt about it. So um, we have to look into the reasons for divorce. And very often it is uh, either, and I have a lot of examples from, from men in Germany, they just have their second girlfriend here or there and women say enough is enough, I don't want this. Yeah? There are different, different reasons. In former times, if a woman is not educated, she cannot say she has to tolerate it because she knows she is financially in the hand of, of men. Now she can say, well, look, I have my own income. Give me my peace. That hurts me what you're doing. So let me, let me be here. I'm not saying that this is good. I, I, and I pray that I, I will not have that experience uh, that my husband uh, or I will say enough is enough, but we have done 25 years together. So I want to believe we will go on yeah. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> in harmony. But you, you always have to look into the reasons why this happens. It's not good. I, I totally... And it, it needs a change of mentality from both sides, and then you can live in harmony. I'm sure about that as well. That's just as a response to your points. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, it's, uh, I'm also, my question was also related to the sustainability, because if the, as far as the project is there, then people could be inclined to please the project stuff and continue and but so changing the attitude and the mindset of the people will be very very important i mean yeah.
to have a longer effect. In Ethiopia, there is uh, one community in northern Ethiopia, uh, the Zumra community, and uh, he start the Zumra. He started establishing such a community where men and women are completely equal, quite democratic, okay. and but it is based on free will of the people mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. the number of people joining that community is increasing. So I think the focus of the project could, should be, in my opinion, to change the attitude because it is yeah. culturally deep rooted yeah. and uh, it cannot change it in a short time. Very true. And the, yeah, the positive thing here is the spillover effect that families are coming. And there is no no financial thing attached to the gender model family. It's not that they are getting any kind of a reward or any kind of money to become a gender model family. It's just on, on, on attitudes, behavior change, etc. And if then more and more families yeah, show up and, and say, OK, we want to be part of this movement, then this is a positive spillover. Yeah. And I think only if you have this kind of spillover, then there is a chance of sustainability. If it just remains with the few families that they have picked, and that's it, and they feel that it's very nice, and that's it, there is, of course, the danger that it will phase out with the project. But if more and more families see, well, this is really an advantage, maybe. I hope so. Yeah. But uh, for now, it's too young, so we yeah. cannot really talk about sustainability at this moment. But I, I truly hope, because there's even this kind of uh, support from the government, yeah, trying to bring gender equality. And nowadays, if you go for project money, if you're not talking about gender equality in your project proposal, they will just put it aside. No way that they even consider you. So that's a worldwide movement, and this is why it needs to be gender equality in your fly food. Yeah, yeah. Ah, I miss it. I miss it really. Yeah. Huh? Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah. Any other question? Uh, thank you uh, for uh, the interesting presentation. You are good your case very strongly and interestingly. One uh, question I have is, uh, is it possible to reach out gender equality without a democratic government. I mean, probably the sustainability issue will be uh, solved if you have mm -hmm. democracy. And yep. I believe they go hand in hand, democracy and gender yep. equality. Yes. Um, maybe there there is more more to it if we come to, uh, if we come to this level. Um, sometimes people misunderstand what gender equality is all about. Gender equality does not say that we are all equal. That's not it. We are not equal. If you look into sports, men are faster, they jump higher, they are stronger, uh, you know, they, they have a different physical strength. Uh, science has tried to, to, to create a pregnancy in men, that doesn't work. Uh, yeah, so we are different. We are different. Gender equality talks about the same opportunities in life. That means if a woman wants to go out and study, let her study. The picture I'm seeing here is a structural deficit that even Ethiopia has. Yeah, because not so many girls went to secondary school and then be able to go to the university. At the Jala University, they didn't even grant any of the women an, an opportunity to do a PhD. We are now on it. We have one PhD student with uh, Jan Frank and another one has now with uh, Commonwealth another PhD opportunity. They have an agri-food task force at that university, 100% men, because they want to have the institutional leaders, etc., and they're all men. So that's a structural problem. The other problem um, is, I believe personally that we cannot count that in gender equality we reach even in politics 50% men and 50% women. Because maybe not so many women want to do this. It's very possible. Yeah? But if they want to do it, if they want to follow this career, there shouldn't be a kind of obstacle. They, they should be given that opportunity. And this is the problem. Yeah, if, if senior lecturers are telling me, well, my girl, but not higher education, that means no university because then she's not getting married, then I really get very upset, very upset. Equality is about chances in life, about granting the same opportunities. And whether girls want it or not, 
that's a different thing. But let, let us give them this opportunity and not say because you're a girl and you should be for tradition at home and, and, and preparing the food for the husband and then very often even serving it. And the husband is not even able to take his plate back. No, the woman is coming and she's taking back, back this plate. No. And there, th that's where we want to see more harmony and sharing in of responsibilities. And um, I think this is a real problem still. So it's about equal opportunities. It's not that we are all equal. Oh, Pat, should I go? Uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm really interested on in the presentation you made. I, I think it's okay, yeah? my voice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think I'm... Uh, uh, I, I want to at some points, it's not basically a question because I'm uh, from law background, I'm a human rights lawyer by profession, so I'm very much interested on the point. And I was trying to, the, whole, the last uh, uh, seven, six days, I was trying to link uh, nutrition with uh, law and like human rights, mm -hmm. women rights, so I, I got the point now. <laughs> and thank you for uh, connecting me. So. To add some points on the gender equality and uh, democracy or legal issues, um, for example, in our country, the laws are very nice. We do have a very nice paperwork. We have been adopting or ratifying different international uh, conventions on women equality, and the law is okay. So the gender uh, inequality is on the practice or on the cultural issues. Yeah. So it's not about uh, the democracy, or it's not my, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. And the other is about uh, the violence against women is, uh, yeah, I, I believe or most, uh, most of the people think that violence against the women is violence against the child, so which is violence against the community. Because, for example, in the city where I'm living, in Awasa, mm -hmm. there are many street children. You see, it, it, it's dramatically increasing. I, I hope you have already observed it. And uh, some baseline surveys show that the children are on the street because of uh, they are avoiding family conflicts, violences against the mother. Yeah, so it's it's directly linked, and uh, they are living in a very uh, uh, painful situations. So every day we see that. So I believe that uh, this gender inequality has direct link with child development, child nutrition, and parenting. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very nice issue, and it's nice yeah. to connect that. Thank you. If I, if I give you one example from Congo, when, where, where I was uh, last year, um, where we looked into school feeding program, and then I looked, I always had small focus group with small children, only girls, only boys. It was very interesting that boys were able to tell me, yeah, 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 uh, my, pap my, my, my father, he bits my mother, yes. And the girls didn't want to really say this. Um, when you try to turn that around and say, well, does it happen in your neighborhood? Then they would answer yes. So even, even yeah, children. And then they say, well, and it happens here in school as well. The boys start already harassing the girls. Um, so this is a kind of thing uh, that starts very early. And uh, yeah, it's painful. In Burundi, it's even more painful. You know what they do to children in Burundi? You have a lot of, a lot of street boys because Burundi is so overpopulated. Again, that is a problem about, um, which we need to face. Then the, the boys are being pushed on the street. Neighboring countries are coming to get them as, as, as child soldiers. Yeah, in, for example, from Congo, et cetera, that's very bad. And the girls will be sent to rich households, and they, instead of going to school, they will start serving, you know, in, in rich households. That's not the opportunities we have to give to our children, right? And that's another, uh, yeah, human rights issue. Yeah. Um, may I continue? Um, I also would like to thank you so much for connecting, uh, connecting us on this issue, because some of us, uh, even if we think we are educated, uh, we also miss uh, this issue in our day-to-day -day life as well as in our you know, career development. I've been challenged by some project donors, where is the link on gender issues and all, and I, I normally don't have the right answer to do it. How, does, how can I connect this with gender? And yeah, now I see that there are quite a lot of possibilities. So thank you for, yes. <laughs> um, my question is on, um, yes, such projects might have uh, an impact on a given village where your project is working on, 
but my question is just a follow up to my colleagues who spoke about it and um, for me neglecting the social institutions it could be traditional you know tribe leaders or it could be religious leaders whatsoever if we don't include such social societal institutions in our activities i don't yeah. think if it if we can accelerate what we want i mean um, yes, when the project phase out, definitely there must be someone or some institutions who take up this and expand it more. Because as I say, as my colleagues said, these issues are deep rooted, sometimes literally mentioned in religious um, yeah. uh, preachings. And um, I think if people in their day to day, you know, for example, in religious Christian uh, congregations, yeah. if such issues are raised and by linking it with uh, Bible and if they say that this is the right way and all, I'm sure it will expand more than what such projects could do or the projects could be, you know, such projects should, shouldn't should ignore the, I yeah, yes, I totally, thank you very much. I totally agree and uh, what I, I, I was showing you is just this very small aspect or piece of the puzzle that could make a huge difference. I totally agree, you have to go through religious leaders, community leaders, and if they are not on your side, then uh, it wouldn't work. But you are only working with communities once you have gone through yeah, the leaders. I mean, that's the approach to any kind of community you're working with, right? So yeah, it's part and parcel of it. It's as well the approach against uh, female genital mutilation that is going on worldwide, and I think it's an issue in Ethiopia as well. Um, even there, yeah, it is very hard. And only if you if you have religious and community leaders on your side, and hopefully the politicians on your side, then you can move on. Very, very true. But uh, yeah, let's let's try together. And I think there there is a lot of truth in this that you will be able to improve the entire situation as well in Ethiopia, if you are going more for a gender equality approach. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my first comment is, would it be um, more scientifically correct if you use the term gender equity than gender equality? Because if you have, um, let's say, a pregnant woman, uh, and then like you have a ration of food, yeah. if you give it 50-50% for the man and the woman, that's equality, but not, that's not equity. Because True. biologically, the woman would require more since she has a baby growing inside her. So I think if you change the term to equity, you would have people follow you more and understand you better I think than it's equality. Not either or. I think it's not either or, it's both. It's both. In, 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 um, there is a nice, I don't know whether yeah. you're aware of this, there's a nice drawing, what is the difference between equality mm. and equity? Yeah, I know, I know it, yeah. You know that one? Mm -hmm. With it's two, yes, three people, yes. Three people, yeah. yeah. Then equality, so equity, yeah. the small child gets yeah. two boxes to, yeah. to lift mm -hmm. the child up, yeah. and the, the, the man has to is not getting any support. Yeah. But if you want to, to promote that one, and you say men are not getting any support any longer, mm -hmm. I think you're running into deep trouble. Okay, yeah? then that, okay. that kind of box, because he can already look yeah, over the fence. Okay. And the woman needs one, and the child needs two. In terms of food and, and what is necessary, um, I would agree, but let's not go for either or, but both, depending on the situation. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, permit me to just add my quick, um, yeah. I um, think, okay, because I, to an extent, have a grasp of African history. Sadly, all right, religious institutions has also a fault here. I tell you why. I know. It's not, um, it's wrong to give an umbrella picture that in the whole of Africa, there's gender equality. I'm from Nigeria, for instance, mm -hmm. in some tribes that don't practice any of these Abrahamic religions. Women are given utmost respect, and it has a historical linkage, it's because most of the ancient traditions, yeah. the goddesses or the gods or whatever, is looked as a woman. Yeah. So that has a subconscious effect for you to put the woman up there. The first daughters inherit everything, they send them to the best schools and everything, even more than the boy. But when you bring the Abrahamic religions in, and then they say the image of God is a man, God's child is a boy, then it also has a subconscious effect. Yeah. And then when you open the Bible, 
it says woman be submissive to your husband so I yeah I know. it's not just a solution but you also have to tell this institution to also change this thing because it did a lot of damage to the thinking of the people yeah and the books were written during a time that this gender imbalances were just What's prevalent, huge, yeah, yeah yeah so we have to be very flexible in that that's a very very true observation and that goes across all the religions by the way whether you are a jew whether you are muslim or whether you are christian if you look into the books that's uh whoa. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much also for the many questions. Um, I hate to cut short because I think it's a very important topic and definitely something that is worth discussing for hours actually. Just to, Goes into to your also actually now, check. Not so? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Also check in your own head what actually changes and where you myself actually becomes more aware of things. So it's it's always good to engage in this kind of discussions. Um, we do have. point out the gender aspect in, in our project as well. So let me thank you in the name of Klaifu to the Security Center for your great presentation. And here is some, um, yeah, some good present <laughs> from the Awasa University. Oh. And also we know that you are a very powerful lady. Thank you very much. There is more power even. <laughs> so continue just like this. Thank you very much.